Hi to everyone who's just logging in. I see some folks starting to come on. I think we're going to give it a few more minutes and then we'll get started. Um, Jessica, I don't know how long we want to wait for folks, maybe another two minutes or so, but as we're, as we're waiting, maybe if people are here on Zoom in the chat, if you want to kind of stir some conversation, if folks don't mind maybe adding in the chat why you're excited about voting local <laughs> this election season, that could be kind of fun. Maybe if people are here. You cut out just a little bit, I think, was that Pam? But it sounded like what she was going to say was if most people are here, we can go ahead and get started. Okay, but Amy, I do like your idea and we <laughs> do want to utilize the chat and the question and answer box. Um, just kind of as a reminder, if you're new to Zoom, um, if you want us to answer a question, please put it in the Q&A. Uh, if you kind of want to say hi or share something with the entire group, then you can do that in the chat to all panelists and attendees. And we'll kind of be monitoring those as we go along. Uh, and tonight we're joined by Amy. Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Amy Stansbury. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Austin Common. Um, it is a local news site here in Austin that helps people be informed and make a difference, kind of our motto. And really what we try and do is break things down, do a lot of the civics 101 type of stuff to explain what's going on in our local community and then give some folks some clear steps for action and how to um, get engaged and just more involved in their community. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And my name is Jessica Foreman. I am the Director of Advocacy for the League of Women Voters Austin area. Um, and we also team with many different organizations uh, like this tonight. And for my portion in the second half, I'll be giving you some information on the county races. And Amy's going to talk to you about the city races and the propositions. So um, if you want to get us started, I'll take my video off and we can switch over halfway through. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right. And I'll go to present. Um, okay. So uh, just to start here, uh, like I said, my name is Amy Stansbury. I'm the editor-in-chief of the Austin Common. Um, I'm really excited to talk about uh, local city elections with you all. So let's see, what's my tab here? Whoops. Okay. Um, why local, local elections matter? So this is a big question. I know I get asked a lot. I'm really passionate about this and I just wanted to set the stage with a little bit of info here, which is like your vote matters the most in local elections, which is why I think they're so cool. You know, a lot of times in local races, um, things are won and lost by just a handful of ballots. 
Um, and also they tend to get really low voter turnout. Um, I, I, I like to use this data, it's getting a little older now, but um, from the Who Votes for Mayor project, which was out of Portland State University. Um, and this is from Austin's 2014 mayoral runoff election. Um, and you can see there only 13.3% of eligible voters um, cast a ballot in that election. Of those voters, you know, we have 29.7% of registered voters over 65 voted, but only 7.8% of registered voters under 35 voted. So what we tend to get is really low turnout and the turnout tends to skew um, a little bit older than, or quite a bit older than the general population. And so um, excited for everyone to vote and uh, like to kind of share those numbers to give people an idea of where we're at sometimes. <laughs> Um, and so the, lo the races that I'm going to be covering today um, are uh, two local races for basically we have city council. So if you live in Austin, what you're going to be voting on this November are city council races. Half of Austin city council districts, so five out of the 10, are up for election this year. And those are District 2, which is Southeast Austin, District 4, which is like Northeast Austin, District 6, which is far northwest Austin, District 7, which is about central Austin, and District 10, which is west Austin. And so if you live in one of those districts, your council seat is up for election and you'll get to vote. If you live in one of the other um, city council districts, you won't get to vote for your council member for another two more years. And then the other big thing that's gonna be on the ballot is we have two what they call props, <laughs> so propositions. Prop A and Prop B are gonna be on the ballot. And both of these actually have to do with transportation. Um, and so if you're someone who is concerned about traffic or transportation in the city, which is a lot of folks, you'll want to pay attention to Prop A and B. Um, so just to go over some of the basics for people who aren't familiar, um, city council districts. So Austin is divided into 10 city council districts, as you can see on this map. And each district is re represented by one council member and only the people who live in that district get to vote for that council member. And every two years, five council members are up for election. So half of them are up for election every, you know, every two years and um, they serve four year terms. And what do council members do? This is a big one, right? Um, they are basically like the lawmaking body, you know, if you think about your old school civics class. So city council members, they're the ones that pass laws, which are called ordinances at the local level. Um, and big policy direction for the city. So they set our goals and kind of the big vision. Um, they also help, help to um, set the city's budget and property tax rate. If you've been following the news, this was in the news a lot lately, all about our city's budget. Um, a key thing to know for city council races is that city council members don't run with a party affiliation. So unlike a lot of other races, like on the ballot, sometimes next to a person's name, you might be used to seeing a little R or a D for Republican or Democrat. City council members do not run technically affiliated with any party, um, which also means that there could be lots of council members running in a single race. Um, and then last thing that I have on here for council members, they also just kind of help as your liaison with the city. So if you are having trouble accessing city services, you can think of your council member as a bit of an advocate. Um, and it is a full-time job. A lot of people ask that. Um, we don't have time to go through every single one of those specific city council races because there's a lot of candidates running. Um, but just to point out some key issues of the election, um, if you're interested in these issues, you definitely, and you live in these districts, um, you definitely want to follow the district, these council races. So big issues happening right now. Police reform is a big one. Um, obviously, if you've been following the news, our city council just passed a um, pretty different budget than they ever have in the past that has a lot to do with reimagining public safety in this city. Um, this election is going to be kind of a referendum on that, right? So there are plenty of candidates who are opposed to council's decision there who are running, and there are other candidates who maybe want them to go even farther. Um, homelessness and housing affordability, another big issue. If you've been seeing, obviously, homelessness has been an issue in Austin for a while. Um, and city council did make some changes to our homelessness ordinances a few years ago. That again has been controversial. Um, so there'd be a lot of discussion about that as well as just general housing affordability. Everyone that lives in Austin knows it's really expensive to live here. And so the next city council will have to figure out how can we make it more affordable. And then the last one, 
This one's very obvious is COVID-19. <laughs> Obviously, we've got to deal with our healthcare issues. There's a lot of inequities in the way um, COVID-19 has impacted Austin that will have to be addressed. Um, a lot of our beloved local businesses and live music venues are struggling to survive and city council is trying to come up with new ways to save them as well as support, support families in need. So all of these are policy issues that are gonna be discussed in this race. Okay, um, so that's a little bit about the district races to give you a little teaser there. Um, I wanna dive a little deeper into the two big props that are gonna be on the ballot. Um, so you can see on the right there, um, that's the ballot language for Prop A. So this is what you'll see on your ballot. It's crazy confusing. It's totally understandable if you look at that and you're like, I don't know what this means. Um, but basically, Prop A has to do with public transit in Austin. And you'll be able to vote yes or no. And it's all about public transit. So let's dive a little deeper. Um, in November, you're going to be able to vote on whether or not Austin should make an initial $7 billion investment in Project Connect which is like a major, major expansion of our public transit system. You can see there it includes miles of rail, park and rides, new buses, um, things that we've never had here in the city of Austin before. So a massive expansion of our public transit system. And to let you know a little bit more about what that is, what that expansion is, I've broken it down a bit. So um, one of the big new things that would be built if we pass this proposition is the orange line. It's one of two new light rail lines. Um, light rail is basically just a fancy term for inner city rail. So frequent stops um, that you would use if you're just traveling within the city. Um, and I have a little zoomed in version so you can see closer here where it would run. Um, it would go down South Congress, past St. Edwards, into downtown, past UT, um, and then all the way up to Runberg, North Lamar Transit Center. And that would be rail. And then the second rail line is called the blue line. Um, and this one would really go to the airport. Um, that's the big deal here. So you can see it would go to the airport, it would go down Montopolis, Riverside, um, kind of more the east side of town, and then connect um, with the other rail line downtown. And then we have this downtown transit tunnel, another big new idea for Austin. Um, a lot of these trains, these two new rail lines would connect in essence with this downtown transit tunnel. Um, and so this would be genuine underground rail and stations that you would access in downtown. They would be air conditioned, they would include restaurants, live music, kind of a little bit of a vibe going down there, you know, um, like you would see in a lot of other cities. Um, and it would be a way for you to transfer between the different lines without disrupting kind of downtown traffic. Um, and then you also have commuter lines are part of this plan. So people might be familiar with, we have that red line um, in Austin runs through downtown and um, up by the triangle, people are familiar um, and up north. Um, this plan would add another commuter line like that one called the green line that would serve East Austin. A commuter line is different than a light rail line just because um, it goes further away and has less frequent stops. It's for people who are just coming in and out of the city for work, less for inner city travel. Um, and the plan also includes an expansion of the red line to include a station at the new soccer stadium that's being built near the domain. Um, also included in this plan is just expanded bus service. So Metro Rapid, people might be familiar with Metro Rapid. Um, they're those red bendy buses. Um, with tend to have faster service, um, less stops. There would be four new routes for that, um, which you can see on that list, as well as Metro Express, which are commuter buses. Again, serving people who are going in and out of the city for work, three new bus routes there. I'm gonna show you all links too at the end of this, where you can dive deeper into these maps. I know it's a lot all at once, but I wanna make sure we get through it all. Um, but you can see lots of new bus service. Okay, the price tag. <laughs> Obviously, this is um, a big question that always comes up for folks. How much is it gonna cost us? Um, this plan um, is $7.1 billion. So if voters approve this in November, that is the cost of the initial investment. And that is actually just a piece of the $10 billion complete plan, um, 
which I didn't share with you that additional part. So everything you just saw today would be what's funded in the 7 billion. There are plans for an even larger system that CAP Metro originally thought about putting forward to voters this year, but because of COVID-19 um, and people being under a lot great deal of economic stress, City Council decided to put a slightly smaller package in front of voters in November. And then the other numbers you can see on your screen there, 45% of the cost is expected to be funded by the federal government. So um, locally, we are not, the hope is that we are not gonna be paying for this entire $7.1 billion system. And then um, lastly, that $300 million um, price tag there is to fund displacement, um, anti-displacement measures along the rail lines. This is a big concern. Um, you're building a huge project here. You want to make sure that the people who live there get to benefit from the project. And so $300 million will go towards programs to prevent displacement. And then what it will cost you, <laughs> um, right? This is the big one everyone wants to know. So $284 is the average Austinites annual property tax increase if voters approve Project Connect in November. And for the purpose of this conversation, average Austinite means someone with a home worth $325,000. Even if you're not a homeowner, you still will pay this. Um, your landlord will just pass this price along to you. Um, but yes, $325,284. And that is not a one-time cost, um, to be clear. That's an annual fee. So that, that you'll be charged that in your property taxes, not just you know the next year, but the year after that, year after that. Um, the idea is to provide funding not just to build the system, but to maintain it into the future. Okay, so that's Prop A. Um, a lot to digest there. Like I said, I'll share links so that you can dive deeper into these maps. The key thing for you to know, just to be clear, is that for Prop A, you'll get to vote yes or no on it. Yes would mean that you approve of this public transportation plan, you want to see it happen and that you're supportive of the property tax increase that comes with it. No means that you are not supportive of this plan and the property tax increase that comes with it. Okay, on to Prop B, um, which is the other tra transportation related proposition on our ballot. Um, this one is also about transportation, but less public transit. So again, you can see, um, all that confusing text there of what's gonna be on the ballot. But um, I like to just think of Prop B as sidewalks and bike lanes. That's a big portion of Prop B. Okay, so um, this is a $460 million bond uh, that if passed will increase sidewalks and bike lanes in Austin. Um, and for folks that aren't familiar with what a bond is, um, a bond is just a fancy name for like a loan for a city. So just like you might take out a loan to buy a house and pay your mortgage, um, the city has to take out a loan if they want to fund big capital projects like this. And then the way that they tend to pay back that loan is by raising the property taxes on us, the voters. And that's why we get to have the final say in whether or not we want this project to happen. So what is included in that bond? Well, we have $80 million um, to fund new sidewalks in the city of Austin, about 100 miles of new sidewalk construction. Um, as it says there with an emphasis on sidewalks that address ADA barriers and connect Austinites to transit stops. Um, and we're missing a lot of miles of sidewalks here in Austin. We have a whole bunch of plans to try to address it, but um, they rarely have funding. <laughs> so that's what this bond would try to do is provide some more funding for sidewalks. And bike lanes, um, $120 million would go to um, the construction of new protected bike lanes. This is key. Um, this isn't just like a painted strip on the side of the road, but this is a protected bike lane. So um, it would have those little ba physical barriers to protect you from traffic because more people use bike lanes when they have that physical protection. And it would get Austin 80% of the way to our goal of a 370 mile bicycle network. Um, it includes, and as you can see here just at the bottom, it includes bike lanes and urban trails. An urban trail is basically things like the Walnut Creek Trail, um, the hike and bike trail. It's areas that really are completely disconnected from the road. 
Okay, also included in this bond are safety improvements, $65 million for Vision Zero improvements. Um, Vision Zero is a plan we have in the city of Austin to try and eliminate all traffic related deaths in Austin. And so these are things like those pedestrian hybrid crosswalk beacons you might see, better signage. And then $20 million for our city's safe routes to school program, which mostly includes sidewalks um, and other ways to make it easier for kids to walk safely to school. Um, $16 million would go to um, a construction of the Longhorn Dam multimodal bridge. So if people are familiar downtown, we have that Pfluger pedestrian bridge where there are no cars on it, it's just for pedestrians. This would be similar, but for the Longhorn Dam in East Austin. Um, and you can kind of see a little mock-up of it there. It would connect to the hike and bike trail um, and make it safer for bicyclists and pedestrians to get across. $30 million would go to making Congress Avenue, um, the section from Riverside to Cesar Chavez, um, more pedestrian and bike friendly, including basically a complete redesign of the Ann Richards Bridge, which is that bat bridge. Um, you can see on this little mock-up here, it includes really adding some dedicated bike and scooter lanes and widening the sidewalks. Um, so there's more space for people to ride their bikes and look at bats at the same time. And then lastly, $53 million for road improvements. So these are improvements on substandard streets um, that would make them not just better for cars, but also would likely add a bike lane and a sidewalk. And you can see the list of um, roads that would likely get that funding there on the right. Um, and what it will cost you again, this is the big question. Um, if this bond passes, um, the tax estimate is 65 additional dollars a year for the average Austinite, again, with that home worth $325,000. Um, and then you can see again, just the list of everything this would fund, sidewalks, bikeways, safety improvements, all of that. It's a long list of projects. Okay, <laughs> I know that was a lot of information all at once, um, but basically um, the, the key thing to remember with these local races, like I said, is I, as you can see, this is the things that impact your daily life the most. We're talking about bonds that are going to increase your property taxes, bonds that are gonna fund projects that you might find really useful that might make it easier for you to get to, you and your family to get to work or to get to school or to get to your job, right? Um, and at the same time, we're also electing half of our city council. And they're the ones who are making these big decisions about how do we um, provide affordable housing for Austinites? What do we do about homelessness? Um, what do we do about public safety? Big issues that you've been seeing in the news that you might be grappling with. These are the people who are gonna make those changes. And so voting in these elections is super key. Um, if you wanna learn more and stay engaged with us, I've got some information there. Um, the best way to stay in contact with us is to follow us on Instagram. Um, we're at the underscore Austin underscore common. Um, twice a week, we post uh, news explainers about what's going on in our city. And for the next few weeks, we are dedicating those solely to the election. So um, we'll be doing a deep dive into each of those five district city council races with information comparing side by side, who are the candidates running, what are their positions on each of these issues. Um, so you can stay tuned for that. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at theaustincommon.com. We post in there weekly action items, community event recommendations, um, and we're also launching a, a, a podcast uh, later this week in partnership with KOOP 91.7 FM, and we're dedicating that podcast for the next few weeks also to election shows. So um, lots of ways to stay engaged, and you can always reach out to me either in the chat. I haven't been able to see if there are questions yet, but I'll take a look. Um, or on Instagram, you can direct message us at any time and ask your questions here to help and keep people staying engaged. Thank you, Amy. Um, there were a good number of questions in the Q&A and the chat, and I did do some answers, but I would love it if during my portion you'd go back in and add uh, 
some flair to some a couple of things. I did have somebody ask if we had a feel on how likely they are to pass, and I, I did. I was able to say no. I'm not really sure. <laughs> but um, uh, very good questions for everyone. Please uh, keep that going during this next portion. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to switch over to the county races, and then at the end of this, Amy's going to come back, and we're going to do kind of an open Q and A um, in case we don't have time to finish all the questions. So. I now am going to share my screen here and we will move over to the county races. So there's an election this year. <laughs> you all are aware of that, obviously. Um, and mostly what you're hearing about is the presidential election, right? The Senate uh, election. Maybe you're even hearing more about the city council election and the bonds than your county elections. But those are also coming up for you. They're on the ballot and there is a lot of them. So let's get started. Uh, first off, I wanted to give a little shout out to the League of Women Voters. We are a nonpartisan political organization. Um, we don't come out for a person or party, but we do advocate on specific issues and we put out the voters guide. I have a photo here of the primary voters guide because the general election voters guide is not up yet, but it is coming out soon. We are in the process of having it translated into Spanish and for the first time ever, Chinese and Vietnamese. And in the voter's guide, uh, we have sent out questions to every single person running for office and they have sent us answers in their own words. So it's a really great way to um, figure out who you're voting for and what their priorities are. So you're gonna see some big themes over and over again. We talk about county um, officers and county elected officials. Uh, how do they handle stakeholder relationships? In other words, how do they get along with other elected officials? Um, what are they gonna do with limited resources? Everyone's going to see their budget cut due to uh, COVID-19 and tax revenue not coming in as much as normal. So how are they gonna handle that? It is a politically heated time right now. Um, so can they kind of handle the pressure? What kind of management skills do, we, do they have? Um, these are big offices with big budgets and lots of staff. And something that we can't go without saying, um, do your elected officials should have integrity, they should be ethical, they should have a good demeanor, the kind of people we want to represent us. So looking at the first group of county officials, these are our policy makers. And we had one get added to the ballot pretty recently. This is not a normal year for the county judge to be up, but our uh, former judge Eckhart resigned to run for a state Senate seat and that uh, left it open. And so now we have some folks running from county judge. Uh, County judge is interesting because the county judge in Travis County actually doesn't hear any court cases. Instead, you want to kind of think of them like the mayor of the county. Now, they might not like that. They might say you should think of the mayor like the county judge of the city, but you get the point. They're, they're going to kind of manage the priorities of the county, manage the budget being the big one. And they also serve as the head of emergency management, which is particularly important right now with COVID-19. They are gonna sit at the head of a county commissioner's court and two commissioners, precinct one and three are up for election this year. And the commissioner's court, again, they're not gonna hear court cases. They are going to decide policy for the county. The big thing is they're going to adopt the budget and the tax rate. They fill appointed positions. They're gonna set the salaries and um, they're responsible for a lot of transportation, a lot of uh, land use and things like that. So to kind of give you an idea of what the issues are they're facing right now, um, and while I go through this, I would like you to pop into the chat um, which issues you're most interested in, uh, you care about the most for your county officials. What, what do you want them kind of paying attention to? So the property tax cap passed in the last legislative session, meaning they have a cap where they can't raise our property taxes above that, and taxes are not coming in as much as normal, so they're going to have to figure out what to do. Um, are they going to cut budgets? Which ones and how? How do they get along with the city of Austin or if it's another county surrounding those cities? How do they get along with 
the state of Texas. Um, transportation and land use, water, planning, flooding, fire, all of that falls under uh, county. I saw a question in the chat earlier, like uh, someone out from the Y and some areas out there may be outside of the city limits in the county. Um, what's gonna happen with fire protection, say out in that area? And criminal justice reform. The county commissioners set the budget for the sheriff and all of the constables. So if you're interested in funding less, funding more, how that funding is used, you would want to talk to your county commissioners on that issue. Okay. Going on to the next group, and I'm sorry we're having to scroll through these so fast, but there's so many. Um, Law enforcement races. There are a couple different groups going on here with law enforcement. First, though, this is a question we get. Okay, what is the difference in city police and sheriffs and constables? And that's a good question. So sheriffs and constables are elected officials and city police, the chief of city police is appointed by the city council. So the Austin, or in our case, the city manager, it kind of depends. Um, but that means that the sheriff and the constable are elected. So they each represent different jurisdictions. Think of that as areas of control. The the sheriff is over all of Travis County. Constables are divided up by precinct, so they have jurisdiction within their precinct. They're all law enforcement officers. They can all arrest people who are breaking the law, but they tend to divide up their duties in different areas. So the sheriff and what the sheriff in Travis County is going to do is first off manage and operate the county jail and the county jail is where most folks go who have felonies or who are in jail for a significant amount of time. Um, they enforce criminal laws. Uh, you can, might see them on Lake Travis giving a ticket for boating while intoxicated, for example. Um, they provide security for the courts and they serve warrants and civil papers. These are papers for the courts and they regulate bail bondsmen, not necessarily here. We have a board for that, but they oversee a lot of different commissions. So the sheriff here, some of the issues that are coming up is just a general issue across all types of law enforcement. What is the role of law enforcement in our communities? What do you feel the role is? What do you want to see the next sheriff do about some of these issues? Uh, that's a hard one to discuss in one little line and it's kind of the one leading this race, but it's important for you to think through that uh, because it will influence your choice. Also, what kind of training and what kind of emphasis are they going to put on de-escalation to try to decrease the number of officer involved shootings? Do they want or do something special with mental health and figure out how to respond to calls uh, with persons experiencing mental illness? There's been some particular issues in counties surrounding, especially Travis, over how sexual assault investigations are done. Um, if someone has a you know, is talking to a victim about a sex crime, are they being heard appropriately? Are deputies trained to investigate these cases properly and make sure victims are heard? And then a big one, ethics and accountability. Um, when a member of the Sheriff's Department does something that breaks the community's trust, how is that handled? Are the police seen as above reproach or do they have good customer service skills? They're respectful in person and on social media have a high ethical standard. So those are all things that you want to keep in mind when you're looking at the sheriff's race. Constables, again, are law enforcement officers by precinct, and they do do some criminal. In Travis County, that's mostly going to be some traffic, um, but mostly what they do is serve warrants and civil papers for the courts. So say you're involved in a lawsuit and you need to know that you need to come to court, it would be the constable's office that would serve you those papers. Uh, say there is a domestic violence situation and there is a protective order, it would be the constable office that in many cases would serve that order. And they also serve as the bailiff or the court security officer for the justice courts. So what are some of the issues with constables uh, running for election? Again, the role of law enforcement in our community. Um, what do you think about that? 
efficiency in the courts. And what we mean by efficiency is how are people knowing what to do because papers are getting served efficiently? Like if I'm going to be in court, required to be in court by law, I want to know as quickly as possible, right? So are the constable's office and the folks running for that position like really good at management so that they can stay on top of these things? Um, how do they handle uh, mental health? Um, are they familiar and trained with how to work with this? Uh, they serve a lot of domestic violence papers. Are they aware of issues surrounding domestic violence? Are they compassionate toward it? Um, homelessness is a major issue that some of uh, the constable's offices interact with. They're often folks that have a lot of experience with the courts and it's very hard um, to serve papers for folks that don't have permanent addresses. So are our constable's offices aware of the best practices for how to do this and, and compassionate in the way that they do this. So these are all some different priorities you could be looking for if you want to Post in the chat things that are important to you on this. I see um, need more training on domestic violence calls and appropriate responses and a lot about criminal justice reform. Uh, so keep popping those in there too. Okay, our next category, I'm calling this criminal justice. Really, this is gonna be our county attorney and our district attorney. And these are two offices that can be kind of confusing because uh, they both are prosecutors. So what is the big picture difference? Well, the district attorney is going to prosecute felonies. These are um, murder or, you know, um, like really serious crimes. And a county attorney is gonna prosecute misdemeanors. So these could be like a first drug possession or a traffic ticket and things like that. Uh, and county attorneys also represent the county in civil suits, AKA when the county gets sued, they represent the county. So district attorney there, you've seen this on TV a lot and many shows, they're gonna get all the evidence and determine if there's grounds for prosecution. And then if so, they're gonna present their side of the case at trial. Um, we're in a very interesting place nationally in the conversation surrounding district attorneys. Uh, if you took a time machine back to 1990, you would hear most DAs across the US saying, lock up the criminals and throw away the keys. Um, but our opinion on prosecution is undergoing a real change and we're having a national conversation about it. If I could sum up in one minute, which is difficult, uh, what this conversation is, here's what I would say. The DA represents the state of Texas when prosecuting felonies. The DA helps get justice to the victims of crimes by investigating and prosecuting efficiently. The DA also has a duty toward the defendant to investigate and make sure the evidence points to prosecution. And the subtext to that would be, and not prosecute if it doesn't. So for a long time, DAs have been really good at one and two, representing Texas and helping victims by investigating. And now that third one, making sure we really want to prosecute these crimes, there's enough evidence to prosecute them, is becoming more of the main thing, overzealous prosecution, especially in drug cases, and under prosecution in certain cases like sexual assault are some of these conversations that we're having a lot right now. So looking at this, um, how do you want your DA to prosecute drug possession? Maybe you want them to prosecute that less. Uh, what about sexual assault prosecution? Maybe you want DAs to prosecute less on almost everything, or maybe you have mixed opinions on this. Um, there's a lot of really good news articles where you can go deep into this. Um, so I encourage you because it's a very important position, like all of them. But uh, this one in particular can send people to prison for life. So we want to be, you know, very knowledgeable about that. Our county attorney, okay, it's gonna do kind of the same thing, represent the state of Texas in prosecutions, but here we're talking misdemeanors, class A, B, and C, and representing the county in civil suits. So what are the main issues here? Um, how do we wanna prosecute misdemeanors? Do we always want jail time? Or uh, do you as a voter want more alternative punishments like community service? 
Uh, there's things called diversion programs. Uh, an example might be, um, say you have a DUI, and instead of getting jail time, they may put you in a diversion program where you go into an alcohol rehab or an anger management program if you had a first time domestic violence offense. So these diversion programs put you in jail less and have you follow kind of a different program uh, to fix the problem. There's also specialty courts in the misdemeanor courts. So if they're getting a whole bunch of one type of case and there's a real uh, finesse to handling that, for example, issues dealing with mental illness, they may make a specialty court so that everyone who's dealing with individuals in that court will be knowledgeable about, say, domestic violence or uh, mental illness. So you could want more specialty courts as an example. And then again, we're going to represent, this position is going to represent the county when the county sued and also um, give advice to other elected officials, like say the sheriff is looking into something or the commissioners want an opinion on something, they will come to the county attorney um, to get that opinion. Judicial races. This is the one I probably get asked the most questions about, and I think it's one of the most complicated to vote on, and there are a lot on there, so I appreciate everybody doing their research on this. District courts, county courts of law, appeals courts, oh my, um, how do we know what they are? So we're going to try to give you a little infographic to look at the different levels of courts in the state of Texas. If there's a blue star, that means that there are going to be some on your ballot. At the bottom, we have municipal and justice courts. They hear like your traffic tickets, things like that. Right above them, county courts at law. We're going to see some of those positions on the ballot. Those are misdemeanor courts just what we just talked about. Uh, maybe first time domestic violence or a DUI, okay? So these are class A and B. Then you have district courts. There's two types, uh, civil and criminal, or they can hear both civil and criminal. And we'll go into that in a little more detail. And then those are your trial courts. So they hear the cases and they could get appealed up to the Court of Appeals and then appealed again up to the Supreme Court and Court of Criminal Appeals, which are co-equal. They just hear different things. Everything criminal going to the Court of Criminal Appeals and everything civil going to the Supreme Court. Uh, these are all on your ballot too, but unfortunately these are statewide races, so we won't be covering them tonight. Um, but looking back at some of the things we just covered earlier. Your district courts will be on your county ba ballot. And what is the difference or what is a civil court and a criminal court? A civil court could hear different kinds of things like family law, for example, divorce or child custody hearings. It could also hear uh, civil contract law, say um, there's Say there's a lawsuit about a cancellation of a wedding for COVID-19, okay? That could go to your civil district courts. A medical malpractice, you're suing a, a doctor, for example, a debt claim, you owe a large amount of money or a business owes a lot of amount of money, this would go to your civil courts. Criminal are gonna deal with uh, felonies from drug cases all the way up to capital murder cases and everything in between. So what are the issues you're looking for when you want to vote for judges, okay? Types of experience. Do they have a broad uh, experience level? Have they have experience with both civil and criminal? Um, do they fit the position that they're running in based on their experience? Um, do they want to provide access to justice? Um, what this means is, are they going to treat everybody equally, whether or not you have an attorney? Are they going to uh, make things easy for you, say by holding virtual hearings in the time of COVID-19 or um, allowing things to be simply understood on their website? Uh, how do they deal with self-represented litigants? Now, uh, the criminal district judges would have attorneys, but in family law, many times folks represent themselves. Do they treat them equally as someone who comes in with an attorney? Do they have good organization and management? These are big offices and complex uh, dockets and things you have to manage from just many cases at one time. So you want people that are really good uh, managers that can kind of be the CEO of their court. 
And one that I think is the most important is what is their demeanor? Are they respectful to everyone? Do they have a sense of fairness? Do they have a sense of decorum that you expect for a judge? And of course, ethics and integrity. You don't want someone unethical um, weighing on things that are kind of the basis of ethics, right? So then the next court down below it is the county court at law, and this is going to hear class A and B misdemeanors and civil cases below 200,000. So it's kind of going to hear the same types of cases, just less money and less uh, options for punishment. So there is some jail time, but not prison time associated with these. Um, so what are the issues you want to look for? A, a lot of them are very similar to what we just talked about, but there's a lot more self-represented litigants in the county court at law, a lot more folks without attorneys. So you really want to look at somebody that can talk to average people like myself and explain the law to me, even when I don't come in with an attorney. Um, how do they feel about rehabilitation? Again, this goes back to, do you want jail time for your misdemeanors or, or are you someone who wants to see more diversion programs? So knowing how the judge feels will go a long way toward that. A uh, docket management, again, they're the CEO of their court and of course, demeanor and integrity. Uh, again, domestic violence and mental health specialty courts in the county court at law, so important to have a good demeanor, to be respectful to everybody, um, to make, the justice process seem fair and to make it work. Okay, now, last but not least, our county tax assessor collector gets its own category because I couldn't really come up with a clever category above that. Um, what is the tax assessor collector? Well, they calculate the property tax. So they don't pick the property tax rate. That's not them. So we wanna, we wanna real fast start off and so you don't start you know, throwing bricks at our poor folks running here. Uh, but they're gonna do a lot of the processing and collecting for the money and for registrations and for different licenses in the county. Um, another thing is they do voter registration, which is something we at the league think is very important. Um, so let's look at some examples of what's important to them. This is a big department. There's a lot of folks that work under this department. So you've got to have someone with good management skills, right? Um, customer service. If you, you know, you want, you have a question about your tax rate or you want somebody that can be very um, easy to get through to and will explain the information to you in a way you feel comfortable knowing. So good customer service, maybe even more so than some of the other positions. How are they with tech and cybersecurity? Many different uh, state agencies and cities and counties have been hacked, have had ransomware attacks. This is one department you really don't want that to happen to. So is the person really tech forward and savvy and thinking about that? And of course, are they good at their voter registration efforts? Um, so kind of thinking of what's important to you, management skills and all that. So that is kind of the, I'm looking to see, I think I made it just under time. Amy was making me nervous because she was so spot on on her timing. So, whew. Um, but if you have any questions about any of those uh, races, put them in the chat. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can bring Amy back up to here. And in this last part, I think we just want to see what kind of your overall questions are. And uh, not just your questions, but of that, was there anything that you learned that you thought was really interesting or um, questions about it? Or you're thinking, this is gonna be my number one priority. I wanna frame a lot of who I'm trying to decide to vote on based on land use law. Okay, maybe not everyone's super excited about that one, but <laughs> transportation or the environment or criminal justice. Like what are some of the issues that you're really looking for in all the different races? Don't put the Jeopardy music on. Yeah, that was awesome, Jessica. Thank you. I, I think, you know, it's like um, all of this, information. I, I think there are so many people and myself included a lot of times that, you know, you just go into the voting booth on election day and it's like, oh no, this list is so much longer than I had 
anticipated and I thought I was informed, but I, I don't know a lot of these names. And then you feel stressed, like, should I just leave it blank? Is that a waste? Should I, should I guess? And so like watching this stuff right now and, and starting to make a plan will make you way less stressed come whatever your election day is. Cause I know people are going to be voting at all different times this year, yeah. but <laughs> Um, we do have some good questions and we did get asked to read the Q and A's we've answered out loud okay, for folks on the Facebook. Uh, we did just see one. I live in the Wells Branch mud. Do the transportation bonds apply to me? You know, that's a good question. I don't know if you know the answer to that, Jessica. I, I don't know precisely. I, I, uh, pretty soon there will be tools I know on, on the county's website that allow you to type in your address and you'll get a list of a sample ballot. My understanding is they're not quite available yet, but the MUDs are tricky. Sometimes they're in different races and sometimes they're not. I don't know if you know more than I do on that one, Jessica. All I can tell you is my MUD is in it Okay. and I'm in Raton Creek. I don't know how helpful that is, but um, some of the MUDs, like she said, it, it can be really complicated. So we wouldn't want to take a guess on that one, but the ballot should be up on the county clerk's website for you to see your ballot and vote 411 uh, with the League of Women Voters will be up so you can see soon. So that's your best bet on that one. Um, some other things we've got here. Criminal justice reform is one of the most important things we can do, including consequences other than jail time. Uh, that's a really good point, especially because a lot of times the conversation we're having now is around policing, but uh, criminal justice reform touches district attorney, county attorney, all of those judicial races and law enforcement and commissioners and council who budget those things. So it really is most of your local races have some type of touch up against criminal justice. Four, and we've got here. So let's start reading out the Facebook questions. Um, here we go. Do you know or do we know about the environmental impact that Prop A will have or if it will displace any residents? Um, so some of the answers we've got here is as a part of Prop A, Cap Metro is transitioning to 100% electric, electric fleet. The first few electric buses are already on the road, but that will do the rest. And there's also going to be some uh, 24 new park and rides that are their goals is to take cars off the road. So that's kind of environmental impact there. Um, for the anti-displacement, this is something I, I was able to research just recently. So um, is it going to displace any residents? Well, there was a real fear about that during Project Connect. And that's why uh, there was a specified $300 million there for anti-displacement strategies. And I was like, what does that mean? Uh, and so it's basically toolkits you can use if you put a train line there and it makes the property values rise and folks who have lived there for, for a really long time are suddenly getting priced out. Uh, this $300 million will go to certain tools to help that. Um, one tool in the toolbox would be to actually purchase land and build affordable housing on these routes. Um, so that's one way. And, and um, do you know of any other specifics on that, Amy? Yeah, I will say, um... You know, there's admittedly, there's not a ton of specifics on it yet, but um, there is going to be, um, my understanding is a community advisory group that's going to be appointed after the election to help steer some of that funding and decide a way to fund it in an equitable way. Um, and several community organizations that are highly focused on this, I think, played a role in pushing to get that community advisory group to be included um, to increase the funding. And so there has been community input going on over the past several months about how can we how can we prevent displacement along the line. So I think it's going to be a conversation that will be an opportunity if you're really interested in this, if this does get passed, to, to be so, super engaged in it because there is going to be a lot of opportunity, I think, for the public to help steer how we decide to use that funding in a way that works. Um, and I'll just add also that um, on the environmental side, um, the Project Connect is actually like a big part of the city's overall climate strategy. So if you're someone who's interested in climate change, if that's a key issue for you, um, our city recently unveiled its climate plan. 
and um, transportation is quickly becoming our largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in this city. Um, and passing a public transportation plan like Project Connect is a big component of the city's overall plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I'll just add that little piece there. Something else that was kind of asked of, along the lines of Project Connect is, um, what do you mean that 45% of the cost is expected to be funded by the federal government? Is that not a, not certain? Uh, my understanding that it's, it's not certain because this portion has to pass first before the applications for those federal grants can happen. And the 45% is kind of based on a review that Capital Metro did um, of federal grants that have been given for similar projects in the past few years. I guess, Amy, the question maybe I have and a lot of folks have is what happens if those grants are not secured? Yeah, I, I think that that is not a question that I can answer at this moment in time or that a lot of people, we have a clear answer on, honestly. Um, I think at that point, if, if that was something that were to happen, um, we would have to reassess what we can conceivably fund with the amount of money we've already been asked. Um, I'm not... Um, this is something that there hasn't been a ton of um, answers to yet, but the, the way these things work is when, when you approve the funding for something like this, um, there's still a lot of input opportunities after the fact. It's not like the thing passes and the next day the project starts. There will be the Austin, uh, an entity called the Austin Transit Partnership made up of community members, council members, different um, elected officials around town. I can't remember the exact makeup of it, but they will help to steer the project and decide the funding there. And there will also be some advisory groups and there will be additional opportunities to shape these things. So if things go awry and not according to plan, there will be entities in place to respond. Um, so yeah, that's the best, that, that's the best I can answer that at this moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> With your crystal ball. Um, yeah. Okay, we have a few questions in the chat, uh, not about Prop A. So uh, first one, I want to clarify something. The county tax assessor does not set the tax rate. That would be the county commissioners. Okay, so the county tax assessor only collects it. So they don't have any control over what the rate is. Their job is simply to be um, efficient and helpful in how they collect it. So if you dislike the county tax rate, then you want to look at the commissioners. They're going to be the ones along with the county judge that set the rate. So, you know, our, our county tax assessor doesn't want to be blamed for that rate. No, <laughs> they're, they're just the ones that are going to actually go out and collect it uh, as best they can. Um, and we do have a question about um, someone, I don't understand code next. Will this be addressed during the upcoming election? And there's not going to be a vote on code next. However, it's going to come up in the council race. Amy, do you want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, so for people who aren't as familiar, Code Next um, is something, it was basically the name given to the process to rewrite our city's land development code. Um, a land development code, I like to say, is like a rule book for the city. It really helps decide what can be built and where. So um, it really influences how much density you can have in a neighborhood and what kind of development you can have there. Can you have heavy industry? Can you have shops and businesses next to residences? How close can they be? Um, and so it really impacts things that we are big issues in Austin, housing affordability, gentrification, displacement. Um, and it was a complicated and fraught process to say the least that we worked on as a city for years. And two years ago, council kind of said, we're fighting too much. We're not going anywhere <laughs> with this project. And um, they kind of put it on the back burner, but it's gonna have to be addressed eventually. We still have these same issues. We have a really old land development code in this city that was built when Austin was way, way smaller. Um, and so, yes, um, we are not going to be voting on it this election, but you will see a lot of council members talk about it in, and council candidates talking about it. This is going to be one of the big, it's always one of the big issues in Austin is how, how do we want to grow and develop in the future? So definitely keep an ear out if that's something you're interested in. Lots of council candidates will be discussing it. We do have a question in the Q&A. What is a MUD? We keep throwing around that word. Yeah, so uh, 
Ahmad is a municipal utility district, and basically it's a political kind of subdivision that provides um, water, sewage, uh, it could be drainage, I'm looking here, not electricity, at least in our case. Um, so it's a, a very random, and there's actually mud elections. I, I used to live kind of in the center of Austin, so I'm new to learning about my mud, um, but basically it's a utility district. So lots of folks are gonna be underneath Austin water. They're not going to be in a mud district, but um, if you kind of lived in areas that didn't used to be part of the city or were kind of not on the outskirts anymore, but near the outskirts 20, 30 years ago, then you might be in a mud. So um, very good question there. Let's see here. How can I become involved and participate in community advisory collaborations? Amy, you have any feedback on that? Yeah, um, I can, I'll drop um, a link into the chat as well here, but um, the best way I would say to start is the city does have a um, on the city's website, there's, they call them boards and commissions, um, is kind of the general term. And these are all of the city's task force, advisory groups, formal ways for regular residents to volunteer and get engaged in this advisory capacity. We have like 70 of them. Um, there's, and so if you go to that website or kind of keep it bookmarked, um, you'll see on there, you can submit an application online. You can find out about open availability. Um, you can also, um, directly contact your, your council member because members of a lot of um, advisory groups for different things are appointed by council members. So you can always contact your council member and say, hey, you know, I'm Amy, I'm interested in this topic. If there's ever an opening, please consider me. Um, is always a good way to kind of keep that conversation um, going as well. And I'll drop that link now. Another question, who appoints and manages the Travis County Appraisal District? I did some Googling to pull that up because I'm not 100% sure of the answer. I think it's the commissioners, but full disclosure, I need to check that. So if anybody knows that answer uh, and you want to put it in the chat, I do have the contact information that I'll drop in the chat there. Uh, but it's not an elected position, so... Uh, but I'm not sure who the direct report is. So maybe we can do some research and figure that out. Or if any of our lovely folks attending may know that answer, you can pop it in there too. Let's see here. Uh, we do have a question. Let me go through and see if we answered all the ones to read out for everybody. Um, what, where, what websites can voters go to to learn about free rides to the polls? I did try to find a website uh, for this, but I didn't see any that were updated quite yet. But in the past, Capital Metro has provided free public transportation on election day and for part of early voting. It looks like their website's not updated on it yet, but I would imagine that will be coming very soon. Um, so look for that on Cap Metro's site. And let's see, do they, oh, here's a good question about sidewalks. Um, I believe this question is talking about Prop B. Um, is my math right? $800,000 per mile of sidewalk? Is yeah. That, Amy, I, were you answering that? I, I did. I um, Don't quote me on this one, but my understanding, because that number, um, it took me back a bit as well when I was doing research for this. And I, so much so that I called back again to the person I was interviewing about this. And I said, is this really right? And <laughs> Um, my understanding is that I don't know if that $800,000 number is cor totally correct. There might be a few other things that might be funded in that bucket, but on whole, yes, sidewalks cost a lot of money. They are always way more expensive than we might imagine them to be. Um, it's very pricey to install sidewalks, which is another reason why there has been a growing initiative in the city to get newer developments at, and when they're created to build sidewalk right away because to go back in after the fact is very expensive. All right, yes, we did just get someone in the chat saying CAP Metro Board approved providing free rides on election day for midterm and presidential elections in perpetuity a couple of years ago. So uh, that will definitely be happening this year. I'm trying to go back up to the chat and see if we 
missed anything else. Uh, some comments, word to the wise, be sure to know your sources of information as you do research. Um, for those of you that have been in the Austin area, you know bonds always cause and propositions a lot of chatter. So there's a, a lot of groups out there in support against. Uh, very helpful to read their websites, but make sure you know what their point is before you're doing it. So you can see, is it an opinionated piece that someone's writing why they like it or not, or is it going to be more of, of an objective piece of information? So always important when you're doing research on this. Let's see. Um, another question I saw come in, Jessica, if I could chime Thanks. in, um, is this one from um, the Q&A, um, do we have an estimated timeline for how long Project Connect um, would take, which is a good question. I, um, I forgot to mention, um, it takes a while. <laughs> um, they think, you know, the, the best estimate is that the trains will probably take about eight or nine years before we are sitting our butts on a train riding them if it gets approved. However, a lot of the other parts of the plan will happen much quicker. So the expansion of a lot of the bus routes, for example, like I already mentioned, the electrification of our bus fleet, some of that's even already happening now, those will happen much quicker. Um, the rail lines, you know, they have to get the federal funding, they have to go through a few environmental impact studies, they'll have to build everything. It takes, it'll take quite a long time um, to get done, but some of the buses will happen much, much quicker. Good to know. Um, okay, any last questions anyone wants to pop in the Q&A or the chat before we close up today? Oh, here we go. Do you know where the neighborhood circulator routes will be? Um, not off the top of my head, but I have in here, um, I'll put it in the chat again, um, a map of all of those places. There's quite a lot. Um, I will say that one thing that, um, one thing that this, they're trying to do with Project Connect, um, for people who have been in the city for a while know that um, we've had a lot of transportation bonds on the ballot before and many have not been um, successful. <laughs> um, and so this time around a lot of city leadership said um, we need to make sure we create a plan that affects many parts of Austin as opposed to just a singular rail line that might impact just the people who live in that neighborhood. So the idea here was to have lots of different routes in different parts of the city so that more people might see themselves um, benefiting from the plan. Yeah, and actually if you go to, I'll pop this in, it, it's on the link that Amy just sent, but I can give you the exact um, map here. Uh, they actually have where the circulator routes are going to be on that map. So you can kind of uh, go through and look. It looks like, um, kind of on the outskirts a lot southwest and northwest and northeast and southeast so check that out too um, can we also get info on city council candidates and candidate forums you guys are doing i believe we're working on a candidate forum but i don't have the information for that right now um amy are y'all doing anything like that yeah i'll just mention briefly that like i said um we are partnering with um, Co-op uh, 917 FM, which is the local cooperatively run radio station here in town um, to be um, have a radio. We have a radio show and a podcast that's launching this week, actually. And um, we'll be posting it on social media if you follow us. Um, but starting on Friday, we are going to be recording all of our city council district candidates. So that next one should drop um, candidate form. So the next one should drop next week. Um, we're going to start with district two. Um, for people who live in District 2, that's kind of a little one of the more exciting city council races, I'll say, because um, the current council member from that district is leaving. She's going to be, she's running for the next county attorney slot. Um, and so it's a truly open seat. It's the only um, district council district race that is like that, which means there's a lot of candidates running, a lot more competition. So um, that's a good one to keep an eye out for, especially if you live in District 2. Um, we'll be posting that next week. 
Yes, and uh, my colleague Debbie Voss from the League of Women Voters popped in a link to our calendar where you can see all of our candidate forum information as well. So thank you, Debbie. Drop a link of the district map. Um, that I that, can do. I think I have right. that on. You did have a question while you're working on that come up in the Q&A. Uh, someone said, I feel like there's a lot of misinformation about Code Next and those sorts of plans. Um, do you have any good resources on how to figure out what would be good for Austin or what the general arguments are? I'm still not exactly sure what killed Code Next the first time. Uh, this, we could do like a 40 hour boot camp yeah. on this topic <laughs> um, because the arguments on all sides are very numerous. And I think anytime you talk about land use, like uh, it can um, invoke a lot of passion, we'll say. Um, Amy, do you have a way to kind of sum up what the big arguments were for that? Yes. Um, I'm going to simplify it heavily. So with a, with a grain of salt there, but um, a lot of the big issues are, um, on the one hand, we're growing a lot as a city, a lot of people are moving here, and if we want people to be able to live in the central core of our city, closer to where they live and work, not have to have long commutes that produce traffic, um, be, you know, be able to access city resources that tend to be in the center of the city, we need to build denser, right? So that means build higher up, usually, more housing in a smaller area. That's kind of like the one side. And, and a lot of people agree with that at, in, to some extent, right? We need more housing. We need to build more housing. We have to put it somewhere. It's the somewhere part <laughs> that is the, the debate, right? And, and so the, the, that's where the rubber hits the road a bit is people are fine with, on the most part, um, adding more density and like the very places that are already pretty dense, you know, sure, you know, what, keep growing those areas. But the, the trickier part is what about, some of Austin's um, neighborhoods that have this have developed and grown over the years as single family neighborhoods. And some people like that, right? That's why they chose to, to live there. And starting to change that opens up a lot of questions and concerns. Will this raise my property taxes? Will there still be single family homes in Austin anymore? You know, do I want to live in a condo or apartment? Or is there a different kind of way? Could we have duplexes or quads? Or will we really change displacement? And then of then on top of that, we have years of um, inequities and um, institutional racism in our historic plans that continue to this day. So there's a lot going on. Um, one thing I would recommend, I'm trying to find the website now, um, is um, Austin's major news institutions got together a few years ago and created one website where they all agreed to post all of their Code Next stories, like a hub. Um, so if you're trying to get engaged, start to read, that's where I would recommend because then you're able to see like a bunch of different news outlets stories and get a little history of it. Um, but you're not wrong to be confused. It's confusing. And I don't think we as a city have really decided what we want to do about it. <laughs> and that's why we haven't <laughs> done anything about it yet. But it'll be a bigger issue again, I think, um, into the future. Yeah, and you know, the only thing to add on that was a great explanation. It is super complex. And if it's something you're passionate about listening to this today, that's why you really want to pay attention to those council races, uh, because that's going to be kind of your vote um, on what ends up happening with Code Next, or not specifically, but more generally what happens with land use in Austin. And additionally, looking to um, outer areas, if you live outside the city, but you're in the county, the land use there is going to be the county judge and county commissioners. And um, there's a lot of big changes going on in uh, Northeast Travis County around the Expo Center area. And they have some big plans for that. So you want your voice to be heard. So you might be interested in your county commissioner's race for that as well. Uh, where can I find a, uh, link to this recording. Uh, Amy, do you know the answer to that? To this one, I believe that the, um, now I hope I'm right, but uh, it'll be on Facebook Live, I guess, if it's being recorded on Facebook. So you should be able to watch it, I think, on the League of Women Voters Facebook page after. And I think it's on YouTube as well. It'll be uh, captured on YouTube. Oh, and then it looks like Jennifer just commented in here, Zoom participants will be messaged. Um, so you should get a notification. That's a great question, I'm sure. Um, you might need to rewatch it again and pause <laughs> as you're filling out your ballot. <laughs> yeah. 
All right. Well, it looks like the questions have slowed down a little bit now, so um, we can kind of wrap it up. Um, thank you so much. One reason I love doing these is every time I do some kind of event, I have like a list. Now I've got to learn all about uh, CAD and MUDs and figure out how to explain those better. So, um, so thank you for that. That kind of helps us uh, grow as uh, educators as well. And uh, thank you so much, Amy, uh, for being with us today. And this was really fun. Good Monday. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I, I love what the League of Women Voters d does and uh, can't recommend vote411.org enough. It's, that's the way I fill out my ballot. Um, <laughs> good way to just do it all at once and have it all in one place. Yeah, and uh, just a reminder, you know, you can bring your cell phone into voting right. location, um, but we will have printed copies of the Voter's Guide in the Austin Chronicle coming out in October. And of course, you can print out your Vote 411 ballot as well uh, to take in with you. And it is getting very close to election time, so don't put off researching those judicial races. Make sure there is no straight ticket of voting this time. You'll need to go down the entire ballot. And all of these races we're talking about are going to be toward the bottom. But in many ways, they're going to be the ones that most affect your life on a day to day and how you drive and where you go. So uh, make sure you're doing your research all the way down to the bottom. And thank you guys for the good questions, really good questions, which makes this, uh, makes this much more helpful when we're able to do that. So. All right, thank you.